Uh, Joe Rowling asked me to read this here today. Um, having seen Dan Radcliffe's screen test, I don't think Chris Columbus could have found a better Harry. I wish Dan, Emma, and Rupert the very best of luck and hope that they have as much fun acting the first year at Hogwarts as I had writing it. I think I'm a tiny, tiny bit like Harry because I'd like to have an owl. <laughs> <laughs> Staring out at a room full of reporters on his very first day as Harry Potter, blinking at the popping flashbulbs and gamely fending off reporters' questions. There was no doubt about it. Daniel Radcliffe was in for the ride of his life. For 10 years, Daniel has lived the fantasy on the cloistered sets at Leavesden Studios and facing the frenzied excitement of fans from around the world. It's been a strange and wondrous and sometimes even unsettling journey. And the one person who can really identify with Daniel's incredible journey is J.K. Rowling herself, because she's lived it too. In 1990, she began writing her seven-book Harry Potter series with little expectation and then watched it grow into a phenomenon unprecedented in the world of literature. And now, for the first time on camera, J.K. Rowling and Daniel Radcliffe will share their experiences over a decade of Harry Potter. Tread on you. No, 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 not at all. Please have a seat. Excellent. So, this is exciting. Yes, it is exciting. This is a chance to ask each other... Whatever. All the things we've asked each other off camera, but now do it in front of but the camera. But now do it in exactly. front of the camera, yeah. absolutely. And, try, and I'm going to try and be much more uh, profound and insightful than I ever have been Go off camera. Go for it. I'm, I'm looking forward to this. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, so I was, yeah, no, this is, this is, this is uh, my chance where I realised that doing the interviewing is actually not an easy thing to do at all. That's okay, we can swap, I can interview yeah, you. Yeah, 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 that would be brilliant. Um, okay, so I thought, to begin at the beginning, how involved were you in the casting process and how much do I have to thank you for... Um, but do you remember working I was with involved, Chris? Or? Yeah, I, I, I was, I was involved. Not to the extent that I was sitting in, in on auditions, but they were keeping me really fully informed. As you know, we found Rupert and Emma, and they were perfect, and that was a done deal. And we still couldn't find you. Will you say how you were found? Well, it, it was just, inc it was amazing, really. It's, it was a bizarre kind of moment. I'm, originally, what had happened was that David Heyman, the producer, yeah. Yeah, um, knew my dad, because my dad had been a literary agent, yeah. um, and my dad had worked with David's mum. And so David sort of asked my dad if I would audition, and the mm. original deal was, that we'd heard was going to be to do six films, and it was going to be done in America, and it was all sort of, you know... It was going to be done in America? No one ever told we, me that. Well, well, you know, well, thank, well obviously, maybe that's why it changed, because you probably put your foot down at some point, or they just went, Joe won't agree to that. Um, yeah, they, which know is, me, they know me quite well. <laughs> which was good, to be honest. That would have been, that would not been good. But um, I'm not somebody who particularly believes in fate and destiny and all those things, but my parents do. And so the final straw was the fact that I was I went to the theatre to see a production of Stones in His Pockets and David Heyman and Steve Clovis, who adapted all but one of the books, um, happened to be sitting in the row in front. You and, believe it? And I was, I was sat there for the whole time thinking, why is that man keep Staring at me, at this me. is very creepy. It was very <laughs> I need, creepy. I need to phone someone. It was very odd. And, my, and I remember at the interval, my mum and my dad both looking kind of quite intense about something. Mm -hmm. But you know when, as a kid, you're, you, you're aware that you're being purposely kept out of the loop, yeah. you know, for your own good kind of thing. And uh, I remember we went up the stairs and out of the theatre and then sort of hid behind a pillar. I seem to remember that it, to some absurd notion that David Amos Deep Close were going to chase yeah, after us, I'm you know, really grab us. <laughs> yeah, like and make you be a child actor. <laughs> um, and um, then there was some debate as to whether we would go back in for the second half, but I was really, really enjoying the play. That? Yeah, and so we went back in, and then the next day they kind of, my mum and dad sort of went, oh, well, maybe, maybe it is the God sort of trying to tell us something, you know. But there were a lot mm. of strange coincidences. Mm, and were. then they called me 
and said, we think we've found him. And then the first time I ever saw you was on screen in my sitting room at home. Because really? They, yeah, they sent me a video of you. And the, the curious thing is, and I'm like, I don't believe in fate and destiny. I Which is you interesting, because it comes you, up so much. Yeah, absolutely. I think you make yeah. your own. Yeah. But, um, so I saw you on um, that audition tape, and it was, I, had, I don't think I've ever really told you that I found it incredibly moving. Oh, thank you so and, much. And Cheers. almost, I mean, it was incredibly moving. At that point, I didn't have a son. Oh, right. Yeah. So, and I phoned David up and I said, he's, um, he, he's, he's great, he's fantastic. And I, rem I did say to David, it was like watching a son, my son on screen. Because after all, Harry felt like, feels like this ghostly yeah. son that I've cool. had in my life. But, you know, to be honest, <laughs> you and Rupert and Emma are all too good looking, frankly. Oh. You are, you know, the characters were geeky and you... But did I, you, you know, know that was going to happen? Did you sort of think they might... I'm not an might... idiot. I'm not an idiot. Yeah. I did, particularly when I, do you know what? It was really lucky I spoke to Emma first on the phone before I met her, because I fell absolutely in love with her. She <laughs> said to me, I've only ever acted in school drama plays before, and God, oh my God, I'm so nervous, I can't believe I've got the part. And then she spoke for like, like 60 seconds at least without drawing breath, and I just said, Emma, you're perfect. And then when I met her, and she was this very beautiful, yeah. which she still is, of course, but beautiful girl, I just kind of had to go, okay. OK, yeah. it's film, do you know, deal with it. I'm yeah. going to still see my gawky, geeky, ugly duckling Hermione yeah. in my mind, but... Do you think that, in a way, we, we shot ourselves in the foot with things like that for then Emma's reveal in the fourth film, where she comes downstairs and there is supposed to have been this transformation? Well, exactly. Because and... we were all looking going, well, she was already a beautiful girl. Yeah, big deal. Now yeah. she's a beautiful girl in a beautiful dress. Yes. Um, yeah. And putting her in fair isle sweaters in the first film didn't make her ugly. <laughs> <laughs> Not that Hermione in the books is ever ugly, but it was, a, it was quite a big deal for me that I, I had written you know, uh, a strong female character yeah. who was primarily about brain yeah. and that she chose to become a little more yeah. groomed and glamorous as, as, you know, us geeks do at a certain <laughs> point in our lives. But um, I accepted it. Emma's a great actress and I loved her as a person. Yeah. And I felt there were so many connections between her and Hermione that did it matter that she was beautiful? Come on. But it was interesting you mentioned about that audition because I was given a copy of my audition where I was... Um... There were, and it turns out, because neither me, Rupert, and Emma could remember this, but it turns out we did all audition together once. They, there was a did screen you? test I didn't know that. where they all tested us all at the same time. And I could hear Chris Columbus's voice off camera. Hello, this is the German Harry. <laughs> time to leave. Be gone from the library now. Scott, cut. Great work, guys. And I just remembered, God, he was brilliant. He was amazing with us. Like, I don't think anybody else could have got the enthusiasm out of those. He's just the nicest kids. guy in the world, isn't nicest he? Nicest guy in the world. And a the real world. family man. Oh, I remember yeah. meeting him and being... I don't know where is not the right word, but obviously this is the person who's going to be taking my baby and... Same way I felt when I met Steve Clovis, whom yeah. I absolutely adore as yeah. well. But, you know, first time you meet these people, and he was just such a, such a nice guy. And, I've, and the relief, both that my book would be in safe hands, but to be honestly, that you were all going to be in safe hands as well. In England, it's different than in America. In America, they treat you first and foremost as a star and then as a child, whereas actually you should be treated as a kid first and then an actor second. Do you think you had any idea that young of what, what, it, what you were really taking on? Do you... Not really, because I hadn't, I wasn't even then fully aware of the scale of the no, phenomena right. at all. I mean, I'd, I'd had the first two read to me by my dad who incidentally did a great basilisk voice. Did he? Um, yeah, fantastic back in the day. I did actually at one point. I can actually imagine your dad doing that. Yeah, my dad, um, <laughs> my, uh, I did actually uh, suggest it to Chris Columbus, which my dad was completely mortified by. But oh, no, so I was, I was um, no, I don't think I could have ever had any, and even now, I don't actually think I have an understanding of how far it reaches because it is a case of not being able to see the wood for the trees. You know, it's, it's, I'm so much in the middle of it that I actually can't see how far out it stretches. I had exactly the same experience, although I think for a while I deliberately kept myself insulated from it. I didn't want to think about it. And when people, people would, would give me statistics, yeah. uh, so many books sold or so many um, territories covered, mm -hmm. and you just, you just think, I just want it to be me and my desk. I don't... Yeah. And, you know, again, people will watch and think, oh, come on, you know, you could see the royalty checks coming in. I'm sure you <laughs> noticed this. Yes. And no, yes, and absolutely, I, I knew it was. But there was a scariness and a pressure and sometimes a weirdness about the... And you know this and I know this. When people are obsessional about something, 
on the outer fringes, mm. you will you will have, you know, strange things going on that you maybe don't want to focus on too much when you just want to write your book. As you say, it's you with your desk. I'd rather be in my aircraft hanging outside Leavesden with the rest of the crew. Know. <laughs> you know, it is, it's, it's, it's weird. So you couldn't have contemplated because I can remember the first premiere, and you were you were oh, shaking. Like, yeah, you were. Yeah. But it was. I don't think any of us knew what to expect, did we? No. I don't think because we because on Potter it's a very insular world yeah, to course. film, so that you just basically, you know, you go into work every day. There's a big perimeter fence around the studios. We are the only film right. at Leavesden, so yeah. normally you'd have interaction between different crews and things. Because it feels very pilot. safe, doesn't it? I always felt that when yeah. I visited. It felt like it does family. Feel very safe. Everyone knew everyone else's names. What was lovely for us was that, from my point of view, and I speak for I think most of the set, in terms of your involvement, you you were around a lot at the beginning and early on and very, yeah. very involved. And then as you kind of saw that we weren't going massively no, off script, you that's kind of completely right, back, completely was... right, early on. But was that was... hard or...? No, it was easy. OK. And it was a relief. <laughs> right. I was, I was around a lot earlier on. I wanted them to... I wanted the Great Hall to look right. I wanted Diagon Alley to look right. You know, there were details that I saw so clearly in my mind. I knew I could. I knew I could help. I knew I genuinely could help, and yeah. I could help them make it right for the readers. And I felt a huge um, protectiveness, I suppose, and loyalty yeah. to the readership. Yeah. Once I knew you were up and running, and it was fine. It was a relief to say, right, there are the films, and I'm over here with the books, and that's fine. And I trust these people, and I did, and I do. Uh, and that's wonderful. And you know, yeah. I think, and I have to say that it was inevitably you had to depart from the strict storyline of the books. The books are simply too long to make yeah. into very faithful films. And um, I can think of many places where it's worked just beautifully. Yeah. And some things are just more filmic and some things are more inherently novelistic. So I, I, I was always accepting of that. It didn't have to be a word for word transcription of my no, world. No. Although some fans are that. Yes, scary. I mean, I do, I do, I do, I'm not, I do think I'm not that, 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 that they kind of, no, you're not, which is wonderful. But I do, I do sometimes think that you know, if we did make a six-hour Harry Potter film, there would be... There would be an audience there would, for There would it. be an audience, And yeah. they would be, still be complaining that there were things that were wrong yeah. and they would want the director's cut. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so let, let's not even go down that route. So is there anything... Talking about things, you know, being cut out and things... Is there anything that we've cut that you were... One, th you know, a couple of things maybe that you were upset about that you thought could have been in? And is there anything that we put in that maybe weren't in the books that you thought, you know... Because I always remember there was... I remember something about Alfonso um, and the Dementors. No, I, I was that, fine. I, I, was, was I, I remember exactly what it was with Alfonso. Yeah. Um, there was a... Well, first of all, the, on the Dementor point, I thought he did those be beautifully, beautifully. And I loved... Um, I loved the fact that they really created that visceral dislike. I, I loved what he did with the Dementors. Yeah. Um, oh, cool. What it was, it was, there was something in the script that Alfonso... Alfonso really wanted to get music into the film. Right. And he was the, he put the choir in, which I loved. Yes, but oh, at yeah. one point, he had this rather bizarre scene where I think, I think Flitwick was conducting and there was this, uh, there were miniature people in an orchestra inside something. And I just, you see, this is my geekiness. I said to him, but why? I know it's visually exciting, yeah. but part of what I think fans really enjoyed about the literary world was there was a logic that underpinned it. There was, yeah. there was always a logic to the magic, um, however strange it, it became. <laughs> and I know it's intriguing to go through the mouth of whatever it was and yeah. see these little people, but why, why have they done it? Yes. For you to film it, that's just what yeah. it feels like. No, you know, normally yeah. with, with the magic, there, there is a point. So we had a bit of a discussion yeah. about that. OK. Sometimes I would dig my heels in on the funniest things. They, you know, I'd be saying, yeah, change the costume, that's no problem. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I don't mind if that happens in that city instead of that city. And then all of a sudden I'd say, but they wouldn't do that spell. You, why would they do that there? Yeah. So I think sometimes I confuse people. But I also remember right back into the beginning when you were cast, I remember David Heyman oh. calling me up and saying, we've tried green contact lenses. We can digitally alter his eye colour um, post-production. How important is it that his eyes are green? That I will, thank you for. And I, I, I said, um, the only really important thing is that his eyes look like his mother's eyes. So yeah. if you're casting Lily, there needs to be a resemblance, but they don't absolutely have to be green. Oh, thank Christ, he said. Because, uh, yeah, because I know, well, the contact lens is awful. The contact lens is there is a very small percentage of people, apparently, who have a very uh, extreme, extreme reaction, reaction yeah. to um, contact lenses. 
and I, I was I one of them. I feel really bad. No, don't worry. It's ten years ago. It's really fine. Are you over it? Uh, yeah, I'm really. I'm over things. it now. Sorry. But there was because also the other thing that we didn't think was a particularly good sign early on was that the, the green eyes went down so badly. But then, um, but then after, I came up in these terrible spots after about a week. Uh, like really, like, and and I, you know, then in my teen years did get bad acne, but I was eleven at the time. You never so looked was, like you had bad acne. Uh, there is was a, that great makeup. That, that was great makeup and and some vision. I've been walking around for years saying it's incredible. None of them ever even got spots. Are you joking? No, I, I, no, 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 no. I promise you, I kept They're, saying, how, how unlikely is that that we managed to cast three kids who go through adolescence on screen? Adolescence on screen, they always have perfect skin. I think Rupert was the luckiest of the three of us. The Rupert didn't have much. But but me and Emma, well particularly myself, they got very very spotty. But in that on over that go, first I two never weeks, knew. it was brilliant because we put the glasses on and eventually we realised that I was allergic to them. I was actually allergic to the Harry Potter glasses because I had these two rings of white heads and spots had come up around my eyes. And it took us about a week oh. to realise that it was actually the glasses. But it didn't. <laughs> it did. It was it's lucky neither us believe in signs, isn't it? Exactly. It really <laughs> is lucky we don't believe in omens. I, I, but I also like that that you sort of people selectively believe in omens, so that we probably just disregard that one yeah, anyway. Yeah, exactly. That, we were, that we would be that. You were meant to be. <laughs> yeah. I remember um, my first day was quite scary because I had. I looked on the call sheet and it just said me, Emma, Rupert and Robbie Coltrane because actually we were shooting the last scene of the film. Don't you love Robbie, though? Yes, it's wonderful. Uh, David Heyman said to me, um, if there's one actor that um, you really want for one of the parts, and I said Robbie for Hagrid, oh, really? and I kept just kept saying it, I just kept saying it, and they, they talked about other people and, yeah, that was a bit of a deal-breaker for me. Um, while we're on the topic of the other actors, um, Alan Rickman Alan. and I, my relationship with Alan since the fifth film has changed totally. Has it? And, one, you know, one, because on the fifth film, I found him very, very intimidating. He is scary. And, and he, is a, he is a scary He's guy. He's just scary. Before, before you sort of, and then I went and did Equus, and then um, we, we went out for dinner afterwards, and suddenly I found that Alan is actually hilarious. <laughs> he and, is, he and, can be very, and very funny. really funny and self-deprecating and kind of wonderful company. And, um, and, and who also was so supportive of me whenever I was going on stage. At one point, he cut short his holiday in, uh, I think, in Canada to come back early and see the show so he could talk to yes, me about I it. I didn't know about like, that. He does, I mean, he's, he's amazing. Like, he does things like that. And, um, but how much did he know originally? Because there was always been this thing of yeah. Alan well, knew Alan, something. Alan really makes me laugh. Um, right, it, it's, uh, he, it's absolutely true. I told him really early on that, he, that Snape had been in love with Lily. That's why he hated James. That's why he projected this, this amount of dislike onto Harry. So he knew that. And at what point Then I that? heard, you told me yeah. that he'd been saying, in, in, I don't know whether it was more than one scene, but you told me that he'd said, um, I just don't think Snape would do that. Yeah. Given what I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I do thought, Alan, that. are you really milking this now? <laughs> <laughs> if your camera angle's not good enough, are you? No, I really feel at this point Snape would be centre stage in the good life <laughs> because of what I know. So then do you remember we were talking about, and I said, well, let's just pretend I've told you loads of stuff. So anytime oh, they try yeah. and make you, yeah, but, yeah, but yeah. You, wouldn't, you wouldn't go for no, it. No, I didn't. Very principled doing, of you. They were trying to get me the other day. They're all trying to get me to, to get a bit pissy about stuff because they wanted to go home early. I've still <laughs> not gone into, the, gone into the crew pressures yet. Um, it was um, funny about sort of telling things because people used to say to me all the time, have you told the actors? Have you told the actors yeah. what and happens? And I don't think we wanted to know. And you didn't want to know. And I don't think anyone really believed that. But I think partly, I know that you started winding people up and saying that I had told you stuff, yes. but that was on set. Yeah. I mean, among the cast, wasn't yeah. it? Um, and then I, you got more than you bargained for, because then you got a taste of what it's like to be me, didn't yes, you? Yes, then I got everyone coming up. Mm. And it was, so you had to back so off So I really had to that kind of admit that it, it, I had actually known nothing all along. It was the one night you came and saw Equus was also Just the, the night, night that somebody threw, threw an owl at a stage. An owl onto stage. And Stuff, you said to me, real. that's the only time that's happened. I said, well, I threw it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry about that. Yeah. And afterwards, I remember I turned around to you and said, Do I die? Go I've on. got to ask. Go on. Do I die? And you very cryptically turned or sort of paused for a moment. So and did you get a death scene? get a death scene, which was sort of... And I saw you double take, you knew. Yeah. You said, hmm. Yeah. I th at that point, I was kind of like, OK, I sort of vaguely have some idea what's going on. And Neil, my husband, afterwards said, what did Dan ask you when he lent in, lent in to you? I said, he asked if he's going to die. What did you tell him? I said, I'm not telling you. <laughs> <laughs> so did Neil not even know? Really? But so when, because I remember hearing a story at one point about, you know, you killing off a character and becoming very upset about it. Mm. and. Would you not be able to talk to him about that kind of stuff? 
I think I told him in advance of um, Dumbledore. Okay. Um, but he didn't know whether Harry was going to make it. No one knew. Really? You really were living with that weight then? It's funny because Matthew, I remember seeing Matthew at the premiere for... Um... He's brilliant, isn't he? He's brilliant. Yeah. And there's another example. You know, they cast what they think is this plain looking kid know, and he grows so, up to be this kind of rock god. And also one of the coolest, most hard working guys on that guy. set. Yeah. I met him at the premiere for Half Blood Prince and I said, there's some great stuff for Neville. In, and he went, I don't want to know! <laughs> All right, sorry. Just trying to, trying to liven up the conversation. There yeah, you are. But you can normally rely on me and Matt for understatement. Yeah, um, it was pretty, yeah, it was pretty yeah. forceful. In the books, obviously, it's how much was were your school days kind of influential on the kind of... Not the, not, not obviously in the magic, but in the... No, 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 not school, at all. I went in... to a comprehensive. All right, so okay. it was, cool. it was So all these kids you've inspired to go off to boarding school. Yeah, and... God, which was the very last thing I wanted to do. <laughs> and it certainly wasn't pro-boarding school. It's simply logistics. There is a, there's a logic underpinning the world. Yeah. And if you are a part of society who's living in secret and you want to gather together a large number of your children and teach them potentially dangerous and explosive things that could expose the whole society. You are going to do that in an isolated place and you probably are going to have to have them bored there. Yeah. It was just logistics. Yeah. But of course, there is, an, a huge, there is an, an appeal to young people. And there was to me, the idea of just being together with the young people and being divested of your parents. Yeah. I think that's quite appealing. Yeah. It's much more interesting to write about if you're talking about kids with kids and the authority not being parental figures. It just allows yeah. them much more leeway. Yeah. So, that, so that's why it was, but it was no kind of a yen to, um, to recreate any sort of 1940s boarding school in, in the slightest. I know this for a fact, and I'm afraid people will just have to take my word on this, because after all, I have met thousands of the kids who've, who've, who've read these books. Children from virtually every walk of life would like to go to Hogwarts. Oh yes, absolutely, I still would. Well. You know, it's a, it's an exciting place. It's spooky. It's mysterious. They get rid of their parents. Yeah. They get to have feasts every day. It's in some ways a fantasy. It's a dark fantasy because yeah. there are things there that are frightening. Yeah. But you could have quite a nice life at Hogwarts yeah. as long as you kept your head and, down. And weren't friends with And weren't character. friends with Harry Potter, yeah, who kills everything he touches. Move, move to Midsummer. Why do you go <laughs> and live there? It's a terrible it's idea. A, don't be friends with Harry. Yeah, because in a way, one of the... Because what I like about Harry as a character is that one of the things that sort of marks him is that has so many of his relationships and so many of his most r important moments in his life have been to do with death. And, you know, for yeah, instance, his absolutely. relationship with Cho Chang... He's Typhoid Mary. Happened. Everyone yeah. everyone, everyone who enters a room with Harry yeah. is going to cark it at some yeah, point. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, you don't well, hang out with him. Well, exactly. The, the, talk about an aura of doom. Um, yes, and that, of course, that was quite deliberate. And he is, he is, he is it, the was... prism through which I view death in all its many forms. Wow. Of course, yes. As the books went on, mm. and you realised that actually there were, suddenly it was getting a massive adult fan base as well. Mm. Did you then realise you could gear it more towards adults in showing that kind of stuff? Or were you always going to confront kids kind of with that? No, I always. Anyway? Well, it's a, it's a very good question because clearly I never went into it expecting to pick up an adult fan base the way, the way that no. I did. Having said that, I had said from the very first, I said to my first editor, Barry Cunningham, I want them to grow up and it will get darker and it will get scarier. And I think you can see that happening right up till four. I mean, obviously, after four, things get very scary, but I always knew they would because Voldemort's come back. Yeah. So some, some, some very nasty stuff happens. So... I really went where my pen took me, and I, bad though it may sound to some people, I never really considered my readership in that way. I never sat down and thought, I just wrote what I wanted to write. Yeah. And things got darker and darker and darker, as you know. And So be it. Yeah. Because Okay, so coming on to Potter, how much then yes. did you know from the beginning? Because there's whole, this... It's almost become part of the legend, the legend of Harry Potter, yeah. that you knew all of it and that like, and, and as these things do, they get out of hand. So the last chapter went from being written to being written to being in a safe with an armed guard. It's always rubbish. That, always, right. ru always rubbish. It was never, nothing was ever locked away in that. And it, did you fuel that at all or? Well, it was, there was a degree of truth. I had very early on, but not the first day or anything, probably within the first year of writing, I wrote a sketch for what I thought the final chapter would be. So that's true. Um, and that, but it did change. Okay. Because um, at least one character was alive in that version of the character that subsequently I killed. 
So, you oh, know, there really? were a couple of people. Can we hear who? Uh, Lupin was supposed to make it, and of course oh, really? he didn't. No. Yeah. Lupin's one of my saddest ones, I have yeah, to say. Yeah, me too. That was awful, pretty me awful. Me too. I, I hated he... killing them. Yeah. But they had to go. You've got <laughs> the chip of ice in the heart of a writer. Oh, oh, That's very says. Well, now, it's, here's another thing, because there's... Was there ever a chance that one of the main... Because I was convinced that one of the main three had to buy it, eventually. One of well, them was funnily gonna... enough, I planned from the start that none of them would die. Okay. Then, midway through, which I think is a reflection of the fact that I wasn't in a very happy place, I started thinking I might polish one of them off. No. <laughs> <laughs> Out of sheer spite. <laughs> there, uh, now you definitely th can't have him anymore. Midway through the book or midway through the series? No, midway through the series, right. yeah. Um, but I think in my absolute heart of heart of hearts, although I did seriously consider killing Ron. Really? Mm. Anyway, um, I can tell you exactly. It's a real relief to be able to talk about it all. It's fantastic. It must be lovely, It's actually. lovely. <laughs> um, the truth is I always knew, and this is from really early on, that I was working towards the point where Hagrid carried Harry alive but supposedly dead, out of the forest, always. I knew where we were always working towards a final battle at Hogwarts. I knew that Harry would walk to his death. I planned the, um, the ghosts, for want of a better word, coming yeah. back, that they would walk with him into the forest. We would all believe he was walking to his death and he would emerge in Hagrid's arms. So that's what always kept Hagrid safe. Because, yeah. all, because Hagrid actually would right, have been okay. a natural to kill in some ways. Yeah. But because I, I always cleaved to this mental image of Hagrid being the one carrying Harry out, and that, that was so perfect for me because it was Hagrid who came and took him into the world, and then Hagrid who would bring him back and, and oh, the onlookers right. would believe okay. he was dead, you know? And, and, and just the, physically, Hagrid being so big and fatherly and Harry being limp in his arms. So that's where we were always going. That's amazing. It's interesting that something like that image actually kept Hagrid safe. I like that phrase. That yeah, it that's, almost that's protected exactly him. what. That's I, Hagrid was never in danger. Um, and as I say, Lupin. When I first created Lupin, uh, I had no intention of killing him. And then it it was sort of borne in on upon me that Lupin had to die, oh. which is awful. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a horrible. I knew he had to go, and the reason he had to go was, what if. Ultimately, I mean, in the final book, you're, you're looking at a war, aren't you? And what is, what, what's horrific about war? Well, one of the horrific things is leaving children fatherless, motherless, and so on. And I, I, I just yeah. came to a point where I thought, I'm going to have to show that again. And the most powerful way of showing that is to kill parents that we know and to leave another. So another baby boy is orphaned. You know, it happened in the first war, yeah. and Harry was that boy, and now it happens again. But, you know, I gave him Harry as a godfather, and I, and I, you, you hear about him in the epilogue, yes. and you know that he's all right in, the, and it's, in, in yeah. as much as he can be. Who was your favourite character to write for? To um, write dialogue Dumbledore, for? Dumbledore. Dumbledore. Oh, well, I loved writing for Ron. Yeah. I loved, um, I love writing dialogue. Yeah. Um, I, I miss I miss Dumbledore the most because he yeah. came from a. I always feel like he came from somewhere back here. It, it felt quite automatic writing when I wrote Dumbledore. He was telling me things I needed to hear sometimes. Oh, really? I really liked that. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Yeah, so and I miss him. You know, to people watching this, there's there is a very cynical way to watch this. The way we're talking about these characters, as if they are real people, and people I think yeah. just need to understand that for you, it's been pretty much twenty years with these yeah, characters now, at this yeah. point. Yeah, twenty years. Yeah, you know, yeah. and for me, ten. So yeah. it's. You do get not just attached to the yeah, actors absolutely. who I blame, this, but the notion a, of them as the principles of those characters. And a very ongoing relationship with them and thinking about them as though they're real people. And um, just living with them, they're, they're in your life. They're in your yeah. life the way real people are. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask about, I do feel I have some duty on a, on a personal level as well, because I've always had my own suspicions about this. Dumbledore being gay. <laughs> You were going to ask something completely. Yeah, go on. <laughs> Dumbledore being gay. Yeah. Well, like, was that something that was just thrown out for the American press to get no. them stirred up a bit? No. Though it did. No, it did, which is obviously you was very funny. But um... yeah, but I found people's reaction to that really interesting, and I'll tell you yeah. why. I, by the time that I said that, I had been working on these characters for seventeen years. Now, not many writers have ever been with the same set of characters for that long, right. so I, I feel. I can sort of speak for all of us who have yeah. and to say it becomes a very intense experience and inevitably you are going to know yeah. things about characters, and I'm characters in the plural, yeah. that um, are not 
in some cases will be relevant and you'll think oh yeah yeah this is the moment that that becomes relevant and i will say that or show that right. for example Professor McGonagall, I had a whole history worked out for her, that I think I thought at some point would become relevant, that she'd had a love affair with a muggle and it, that she'd had this quite tortured past uh -huh. and she ended up being this celibate elderly teacher. Um, never became relevant, never happened. And as time went on and I got to know Dumbledore, and I, and, but this is before the publication of Philosopher's Stone, so bear in mind, I, at this point, I've been with him for seven years, I knew he was gay. I just knew he was gay. Okay. And to me, it was not a big deal. This is a very old man who has a very terrible job to do. And his gayness is not really, it's not really relevant, very relevant to him as a character, because I always saw him as a very lonely character. And I think that there is, in fact, a hint of it in Seven, because the relationship he has with Grindelwald, he felt very hard for this boy. He's yeah. awfully trusting of this good-looking young man yeah, yeah. when he shows up. I don't you think it, it was it was perfect that Dumbledore, who is always the great champion of love, Harry, love will save us. Love, his one great experience of love was utterly tragic. Yeah. Yeah. It was with someone who was dangerous and demonic. Yeah. And so you know, and 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 created absolute havoc in the world and created havoc for him. So that was my idea of Dumbledore's tragic backstory. Yeah. Now. I liked leaving it open so that perhaps a more worldly reader would see that there was, that right. that may have been in that relationship. Yeah. And perhaps a nine-year-old would think he made a great friend and he trusted yes, him. Exactly. Do you know? So Which I was okay with that. Through all the books. But in the context of how I was writing about him, in other words, he's giving, oh, clearly, he, he is, he's John the Baptist to Harry's Christ, isn't he? He's the, nice. he's the nearly yeah. ran man, the man who yeah. nearly could have had the yeah. hallows, but he was too power hungry. That yes. was what was interesting to me about Dumbledore. So he's used in the book, clearly, he's, he's, he's a, the fount of all worldly wisdom, and he teaches Harry what he needs to teach Harry because he recognises that Harry is going to be, he is going to be the one, or, or Galahad to Lancelot, or whatever yeah, yeah, you like. No, like he's the, the, he's the flaw, he's the more flawed one. He was the all, he was the nearly ran. Yeah. That to me was what was interesting about mm. Dumbledore. Um, do you remember in the first draft of the script for um, Hufflepuff Prince? Right. Harry, when Harry's at the station and Dumbledore comes to meet oh, him yes. at the station, and in an early draft of that script, Dumbledore said to Harry, um, he said, "I remember a young woman with eyes of flashing, whatever, yes. raven head." And I, I read this and I scribbled on my copy of the script, Steve, Dumbledore is gay, shoved it up the table. And Steve, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so that line, that's why that line didn't make the film. Okay. It's interesting actually when you, if you start to think for a moment, not about these characters being characters, but if you think about the characters, the lives these characters actually have within the books mm -hmm. and the fact that to a certain level, because they ex exist, in the collective consciousness of a generation, they do exist to us. Yeah. Because I always think that's one of the wonderful things about Potter and the Potter fan base is that whereas if you think about the other big costume wearing and all that kind of stuff that goes with it is things like Star Wars and Star Trek. Yeah, absolutely. But what's interesting is that Potter, because it started off as a literary thing, mm -hmm. has kind of created a generation of the same kind of mentality of geeky thoroughness, but with an appetite for reading and literature, which is kind of amazing. amazing. It was yeah. it was wonderful, isn't it? It was just the most wonderful thing. Mm. And at the last premiere, because obviously I'm not meeting readers in vast numbers yeah. at the moment, because I'm, you know, I finished the books. Yeah. And uh, so to meet them again through the films is, is really great. Yeah. I can't deny that it's it's lovely it's really lovely before the books even got picked up yeah until you know sitting in this hotel room of, yes you know, yes what are some of the surreal kind of bizarre oh, i mean start? where do you start i suppose but um, for me the, the last premiere was mental it was mental wasn't it mental? it was, it was with rain and it felt more extreme than any of them had yeah i think that i was in a, a place of false security in that i felt that the books are finished so the excitement will really drop. Full. Yeah, was I ever? Because yeah. I got out and it was like aircraft engine noise, wasn't it? It was scary. Were there more people there? It felt like that. It felt like it because there's this one moment where I looked out over one side and there was just these hundreds, this sort See of tumult of people yeah. just surging forward, like yeah. sort of, and all drenched. Yeah. And if there's ever been a moment when I could have absolutely just formed a dictatorship. Exactly right. I could have just said, we'll march on the palace and exactly. they all would have joined me it's at that scary moment. having that it's... feeling. I've had that feeling. 
In fact, <laughs> the uh, the reading that I did to oh, sort yes. of launch um, Phoenix, which was at the Albert Hall. Was it at the Albert Hall? I think it was at the Albert Hall. And they had all these graphics behind me. It was like Nuremberg. It was, <laughs> it was insane. I'm looking up the who designed this. But yeah, you get these moments where you think, right, rise, <laughs> Harry Potter yes. fans, let yes. us march. Absolutely. You think some of them would. Oh, they would, absolutely. It's lucky I don't have any of those. I don't sense. have dictatorial impulses no. now. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, um, the only thing you can do yeah. is laugh at it, and yeah, it's hilarious, so and it's so funny. I mean, it's bizarre. I mean, when somebody, I mean, tries to, for instance, that we, were, you know, when somebody once tried to jump into the front seat of the car with us, does somebody try to follow us in afterwards? You've got two reactions to that situation. You can either be terrified and think, oh, people are going to try and get into my car, or you can think, that's hilarious that she tried to do that. I'm fine now that I'm safe and it's all fine and that was quite funny. But mm. but no, those those first. I don't want people was... to jump in your car, you see, yeah, that makes me uptight. Okay, sorry. Um, see, this is the thing, is I always get a lot less annoyed by it than whoever I'm out with. Whoever... Yeah, but that's that's also true of me. When spooky yeah. things have happened to me, it's much easier when you're the target, I think, to think you know, it happened, that's fine. Whereas people around you are completely freaked out and saying, You mustn't you mustn't ever be alone in a car again. Yeah. <laughs> just... Exactly. But did you because you've been subject to sort of internet rumours and stuff, the oh, crazy yeah. stuff that comes with it. Do, does it's that brilliant. make yeah, you no, laugh? I've got a, I've got a kind of um, top, top, at least a top four, I think, of these. Oh, tell me, The tell stories me. that <laughs> I've heard about myself yeah, um, go on. was that I was getting uh, SAS guards to walk my dogs. Well, it's best, Dan, really. Let, me, let me advocate that. <laughs> that I was getting... How many dogs have you got? Uh, two. Oh, you um, have actually got dogs. Yeah, my mum and dad. Because it wouldn't surprise me if you, no, there no, were no dogs. No, either. exactly. No, no, no. God, my dogs are quite uh, famous. Are they? Oh, my God, dogs. Sorry, my dogs. I haven't been my, do up. my dogs get as as many presents as I do. Uh, a lot. A, a, no idea. Lot I've clearly <laughs> been out for loop too. No, 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 no. I mean, they're not featured, but they're just people know their names on the internet. And because okay. I mentioned them once in, in an interview. And, so right, um, SAS dog walkers. So as it, the SAS dog walkers. <laughs> I was having for a while. I was having uh, special Breer Breer beer. Brewed in uh, a monastery in Belgium by just Belgian for you. monks. Just, just for me. you. I don't drink. You beer. had your own personal monks. I don't. Yeah. And SAS dog walkers. And SAS dog walkers. I don't That's particularly nice like them. There was one that I'd grown, I think, about um, eight inches in about six weeks or something. That would be extremely which, worrying. Which, as anybody who meets me can tell, um, <laughs> I've, you know, that's not happened. Um, and um, and the but the the one of my favourite ones was. The rumor that um, I was going to be having a statue made of myself for my Solid living gold, room. Solid gold, I hope. I think they obviously think I live sort of like some Roman emperor, <laughs> like Caligula, just building statues to myself everywhere around, you know, dotting them around the studio. Just as Rupert a might sort. have himself made in chocolate. Yeah, he you could know, do something yeah, like that. Absolutely, that would be quite... he might just have himself encased in it and eat his way out. <laughs> that's, that's what. Actually, that would be quite a good. I quite enjoy doing that. I was. I will just um, give you a quick list of the of what is the Grint Menagerie at the moment. Um, in terms of cars, I think he's got. He's just sold. He's got brilliant... the ice cream van still. He's still got the ice cream van. Oh, really? He's got I'd love hover... to think of him in an ice cream. Got a hovercraft van. now as he's well. Got a hovercraft. hovercraft, and uh, we had uh, a bright orange Range Rover with blacked out windows. And I said to, and he said, I'm selling it. And I said, why? He said, that's the colour. <laughs> Which is presumably why I bought it in the first place. But he's, and he's got, um, and he's now got like amazing pets and he's got like llamas and peacocks. And he basically has done, you know, with his money, what the rest of us would have done with our money when, what we said we'd all do when we were seven, you know, and just have Isn't the kind of really Wonka house. I'm really it's happy. I'm and really pleased we about always, that. We always make jokes about Rupert Lord because we, we always he's think he's sort dream. of... He's living the dream. He is living the dream. And we always say he gets out of bed, just into the water flume, down to the breakfast table. <laughs> That's how he sort of travels around his house. But uh, um, uh, as we were saying before, before um, one of my favourite moments, right, in a bizarre way, <laughs> because you know how when you sort of... Uh, offend some people, you know you must be doing something right. <laughs> well, there was my favourite, one of my favourite photos from Potter was, um, I think I think it made the cover of like the Times or some, you know, prop, big proper newspaper. And it was a, a huge bonfire oh, in God, some yes. states in America, I think. And it was somebody had, throw, was th had thrown a calendar and through the air, smiling, was Rupert Grint's face being tossed into the flames, and it was one of the and it was and it was one of the abiding images that I've always remembered. It's that much funnier that it was Rupert. Yeah, <laughs> isn't it? Exactly. Yeah, just so that it was just... quite serene, kind of going into the fire, and it, and, it, and it was lovely. But um, does that bother you, or no. do you think no? What, that does is it, actually does a good it bother sign? me? No, it, it uh, never bothered me because. Um, 
I felt that the, the, those particular criticisms yeah. were utterly misguided. Yeah. I have no track at all with those those kind of views. So if they want to burn my books, feel free. Yeah, fine. Um, I, that, presumably they're going to have to buy copies to burn them. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, even that didn't particularly bother me. I, you know. I've, I have occasionally come face to face with people like that. Really? They can be quite aggressive. Really? Um, I remember on one one of my book tours, we had um, we had plainclothes police checking the place out for bombs because there had been a bomb threat. Yeah. So it was it was real, and I and I look back on that and I um, I mean that that's largely died down, but there's certainly states in America where I don't think I'd be particularly welcome. No. Um, it is what it is, you know. So I, I remember when I was eleven, I was I was at like a party, just like. Oh no! My don't tell me party. someone went for you. Didn't go for me, but somebody like the the mother of somebody who lived in our street, you, you know, was saying, "Oh, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure if kids would be able to tell the difference between black magic. And ma it's magic. So what's the issue? It's a well, book. You know, <laughs> I, I have a real issue with 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 anyone trying to prote protect children from their own imaginations, and I think that a lot of this goes on, and if we cannot. Um, acknowledge and embrace the fact that we all have a certain degree of darkness within us, some more than others, perhaps, and, you know, bring it into the light and examine it and talk about it, yeah. this part of the human condition, then I think we will be living in quite a dangerous um, yeah. climate. And I think I think that's much more damaging for children. Absolutely. I'm, I'm, you know, I think truth and openness are the, the way to go. something can't be talked Frank. about is exactly. the moment exactly. it danger. Yeah, yeah. but it, it, sometimes it made me sad. I remember I went back to my old primary school and that a child had been excluded from the reading. He was sitting alone because his parents didn't want him subjected to my evil influence. And I, that, it did, that made me feel really sad. The opportunities that this has afforded me, because people in interviews, a commonly asked question I get is people say, do you think it's going to hold you back from, um, you know, doing other projects and things like that? And actually, the chances are I never would have become an actor if I hadn't got this That's opportunity. That's so great to hear. You know, for, for, I mean, you have said that to me before off camera. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> For, from my point, that's the best thing I could hear, you yeah. know, that you feel that it's been a springboard rather than it's been a straight jacket. As, as, I mean, as I people would have, have... Never would have got the chance to do Equus or My Boy Jack or any of the other stuff, and anything like... And that's the thing I think that anybody whose career was born out of Potter has to remember, that no matter what we do for the rest of our lives, it's... The chances are it, they are things where we, we, the opportunities we never would have had in the first place if we hadn't got Potter. And we were involved in this extraordinary thing for 10 years of filming that was kind of unlike anything else that's ever been done just in terms of the amount of people that are there and the continuity of, of everybody that's being so there the how whole are you, time. I mean, are you thinking about how you're going to feel when it ends? Because it's been so stable, hasn't mm. it? Always filming in the same place always the same people, which was wonderful. Which is wonderful, but equally... Does it feel strange that you know it's coming, or do you not really focus on that? Uh, just recently, we've all started thinking about it more. Um, because, you know what, it was a funny... The, the moment was, actually, I was um, talking to um, Amanda Knight and Lisa Tomlin, who do hair and makeup on Potter. Amanda's done my makeup every day for 10 years. Um, and is an amazing makeup artist. Yeah, do you remember that day I came to visit the set and she painted, you know, you looked really beaten up? And I walked into oh, yeah. you and Rupert, and I walked into the room and said, what's happened to you? And you said, well, if you don't know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, yeah, it's pretend. Oh, God, yeah, yeah, yes, I, I was, I was, God, I was already giving you drip at that stage. Yeah. I was like, excellent. <laughs> um, and, um, but I was talking to them the other day, and they were talking about uh, another job that they might have lined up afterwards. Yeah. And it was the first moment of actually, it wasn't sadness, and it wasn't, uh, it was jealousy. I was jealous that another actor was going to get those two, because Lisa's done my hair for the, on the sixth and seventh film, but also she was on the second and she's been in and out, and, so, and someone I've come to know very, very well as well. Um, and so the fact that another actor's going to get there is really sort of, is something, it's, it's very peculiar. And I mean, it's going to be odd also because, uh, you know, I've worked in a way with, with the crew on Potter in such a way that I'm, I actually feel much cr closer to the crew than I do to a lot of the cast. No, I can. I, I really understand that. I think a lot of people who, and it certainly includes me before I became involved with the, these films, but people wouldn't maybe understand just how important the, 
the crew are. They're, they're, yeah. they're every day, day in, day out. They're the people you're seeing and working with and joking with. And I've come to understand that too. Because I've kind of worked out recently, particularly on this film, that, 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 if, that success on a film set kind of relies upon the ability to concentrate very intensely for very short spaces of time. Yes, yeah, the exact reverse of writing. Yes. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, and then you have to learn to switch off in the moments that you can, because sure. you can't keep yourself at that level of energy no. all day, although I am quite hyper. You know, my mum and dad have often said to me, they did get lucky when they got somebody with the kind of boundless energy. That, you, you do know, have, and I, you always have had. Yeah. It's always been so apparent. <laughs> Even when you were quite <laughs> small, it was like you were four espressos ahead of everyone else. It was good, yeah, it was great. I think, which is why I don't drink coffee, yeah, um, does, because you can't imagine me after that. Yeah. Um, uh, no, because I remember the first day we met, I think, was when you came in and all the kids were there. That's right, yeah. I think, and, and you know, Tom yes. Felton had his Tom Diablo thing. Tom Felton had thing. his Diablo because he was, yeah, yes. He, yeah. he showed my child, then very young, yeah. how to use it. And I was always sort of, I always had a real soft spot for Tom after he's that. Brilliant. And it was so ironic that we have this, this arch baddie and he's about the nicest. I mean, we keep saying everyone's nice, but the fact yeah. is they are. They are. They're, they're there, were, ne there were never any brats. There, yeah. were never, there was never anyone objectionable. They were all just really nice people. But Tom is a... Tom, I've got... I Tom, and Tom Tom's was, such a sweetheart. He's a bit older than the rest of us as well, yeah. and was when he was younger, and, yeah. had, and had done a bit more work. Yeah. Like, he'd done quite a and few that, films. Yeah. And, things. and in his demeanour offset, that yeah. showed, I think. He was yeah. quite co comfortable with being there, wasn't he? Yeah. But yeah, he was so sweet. I do remember that day. All of you in the canteen, looking around, it was spooky. Yeah. It is amazing. I particularly, I remember um, Devon, who plays Seamus yeah. very vividly from that day, because he of really course. looks like I imagined. Oh, really? Yeah, he was one of the ones they'd really cast someone I, who now, I think the way I'd imagined him. The other person we should definitely talk about, because who I do think is sort of, even though you notice what he does, he is the unsung hero of these films, Stuart Craig. Oh, God. Because his sets so are... He's a genius. I mean, that, he's, for he's, me, he's, that's he's, what makes He's just a genius, yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 Because People, it's the detail yeah. of everything. That's Because that's because I think that's what has allowed us to survive as a successful franchise. Because, you know, because we sort of have... Because we started off at the same time as a whole host of other kids' fantasy films have sort sure. of started. But the reason I think we've managed to do so well and sustain the, the, the story right to the end and keep people interested is largely down to, I think, the sets and the fact that the detail that goes into the world is so thorough, it feels complete. World. And yeah. I, I, again, as someone who's not, you know, been involved in the film business and, and, and came to it entirely new, to be able to walk into the Gryffindor common room and pick up the comics and read yeah. them, it, it's so real, it's so fabulous. Yeah. Kids who visit the set are blown away by it, aren't they? That they can walk into yeah. all of these rooms and play with all these Unfortunately, things. Unfortunately, we've now lost the Gryffindor common room. <gasps> I don't no, know is it gone? I don't, I don't know. It was my favourite set. I don't know where it is anymore. I don't. I think maybe it's probably. I don't think it's because it was everyone's favourite set. It so I think it's probably been moved. Better not been set up in someone's back garden. Oh no, I'm sure that's not the case. But, but I'm you sure did tell me museum. everyone's going round putting dibs on various props. Didn't yeah, you? well, we, I mean, I've, I've really, I'm really eyeing up my glasses. That's what I, <laughs> what I want. I want, and I don't want. It's not what um, you want. You see, I think I no. would want my wand. See, the thing is, the wand for me is a less constant thing. Because it changed after the second film. It's a different wand I've got oh, now. Oh, OK. And because um, in Alfonso's words, he said that he thought the other wand looked a little too smooth and like it was from Ikea. Um, and so he gave me this sort of stick, yeah. you know, <laughs> and, um, and which was which was great. But um, all the chopping and changing with wands in the last book. I, I, well, I we can, are I so... I can explain it to you, Dan. Can <laughs> you please? We are so struggling on this set. I have to say, I will get my wardrobe. Who's this? Who's this? This, this is again? Draco's mum's. Who Who's does this really belong to? It's, it's, and it's because we got, and, and, and then trying to explain it then to Rafe, when Rafe comes on as Voldemort, and I'm kind of looking at him in his Voldemort makeup, and he's asking me about the ones that I'm completely panicking, going, I've really got to find the most succinct way I can explain this to you in two minutes, but I don't know if that's possible. Because I remember I had to reread the end of seven a yeah. few times. I was talking about the end of seven, the epilogue. I, the epilogue changed when because what because some people really I like the epilogue, it, but some people had a problem with it. Some people hate it. Yeah, a version of it, what was literally written seventeen years previously to the book, a version yeah. of it was written. But as I said to you earlier, you know, some people were in there who didn't turn up in the final cut and so on. Um, yes, I didn't. I wanted to give a snapshot. I think what a lot of people felt about the tone of the epilogue was, so this is it, so it's over, so he's not a hero anymore, he's a sort of middle-aged man seeing his... Ch it, it felt like a letdown, but you, I have said this before, for me, absolute heroism is rebuilding after that kind of trauma. Yeah. And I could think of nothing more noble than that he's 
he's acting what Dumbledore preached but didn't live. You see, yeah. Dumbledore preached, these are the values that see us through, that survive, love, and yeah. those sort of human bonds. Harry's actually living it. So he was always the guy to me who had it thrust upon him. He, yeah. And that was supposed to be epitomized to go back to the wands and the fact that he had the chance to have his finger on the nuclear button, as it were. He had the chance to own this, this most powerful one. And he said, nope, want, want, want that one, want that yeah. one. I want my own and yeah. I want to break the, the chain. And going back to what was the moment like when you, I, I mean, how solid is the end of writing the book? I mean, do you, do you give it in and then it's done or? Well, actually, it was pretty, this time it was pretty, it felt, uh, it felt really solid. I mean, I, I had editing to go through. Um, but it was after it was published that it really hit me. Now, I had been prepared, it's an awful thing to say, but in some senses, it, it was like knowing someone is going to die. Yeah. I had a long time to prepare. I always said seven books, that's it. Um, that's what I planned from the beginning. But even so, it hit me like a train. Um, on my birthday, which was the same month as publication, which is also <coughs> Harry's birthday, which yeah. I wasn't particularly thinking about, but I, was, I, I, I cried as I've not cried since my mother died. Oh, really? Honestly, yeah, it really wow. hit me. And it, um, you, I mean, my husband was, why? What, what, what's wrong? What's wrong? You know, and I, I said, I just can't go there anymore. I can't go there anymore. And it, you know, it had been a place I could escape to for 17 years. And I, and I knew the door had closed. Oh. And it was, um, yeah, that, but it was very cathartic. Yeah. And after that day was passed, it became, I became much lighter. And I, and there were, were aspects, you know, of it that are liberating. Obviously, I'm now, I, I feel, I've, I've done that job, yeah. and that's always a good Very feeling. Well. Oh, thank you, Dan. <laughs> I, you know, that's, that's done. But yeah, it was tough. It was tough. I'm not going to pretend it wasn't. I, could, I cared so much about the characters. I loved writing the books. Most of the time, I loved writing the books. Yes. But you tell me how you're feeling about the end of it, because... No, I mean, uh, there's... Um... I feel like a therapist. It's going to be. It's going to be very. It's going to be very strange and very upsetting, and but it's the little things that you'll miss most. Like, I mean, and also it's the the fact that you know. I mean, I'll I'll walk into that studio for one day over the next few months and sit down in front of that makeup mirror, and it'll be the last time that I film that day because then yeah. I'm going off and hopefully doing other things. And as you say, it will be liberating because I'll no longer have to. You yeah. know, when I get sent an amazing script, go. I'm sorry, I'm not available for the next seven years. You know, I mean, <laughs> or whatever. But. So I'm, I'm very excited about the opportunity to just live that sort of actor's life of just of getting a job and going off and doing it and, you know, and those kind of things I'm, I'm very excited about. But, but it's also, there's an awareness that it'll never be the same again, that I'll never have that period of time. And also it's not just, it's, I mean, I look at this more, you know, in a, in terms of a landmark, more than my 18th birthday was, this is me becoming an adult now. This is, that, was me, that is me leaving the nest now, yeah, you know. Understand. But no, it's been, um, it's been a good 10 years for me, so thank you very much. Oh, Dan, that's good to hear. Cool. Good one. Cheers. <laughs>